appreciate uh, appreciate the invite, and uh, it's always uh, always a pleasure to to visit with to visit with you folks. The uh, let me go ahead first of all. Let me get my sharing done here and uh, make sure that that's going to work for us. Okay, uh, Don, am I coming through on that? Yep, looks good. Good, good. Let's uh, okay. Let's arrange the windows here so that everything is working properly. Well, uh, again, thank you, thank you very much, and uh, uh, and 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 Don, forgive for, forgive my earlier comment. I forgot that you were from South Dakota, so I wasn't trying to be insulting when I asked you if you knew where where Sioux Falls is. Of course, you know where Sioux Falls is. So, um, you know, geographically, we're not that far apart. Uh, so uh anyhow again well, welcome everyone and uh you know I, yeah, we'll, we'll probably have a few more folks join us as we as we get rolling here but uh uh when don approached me about doing this uh you know we were kind of looking at doing something kind of similar and uh what i've done you know what i've done is i've updated some of the material from last year and then i've got some brand new stuff that we didn't talk about uh ever before so i th i think i think i've got a variety of relevant topics uh, for just about everybody. Now, uh, remember folks, all right, I am a uh, credentialed uh, tax professional, so I always encourage everybody to uh, seek out competent uh, professionals when you're when you're dealing with this. I, I, uh, I'll just be honest with you. One of the things that makes me cringe a little bit is when I get a call from somebody and they say, well, I'm doing my own return. I bought a copy of TurboTax and, and uh, we're doing it ourselves. Folks, very rarely have I seen one of those that was done correctly. Uh, you know, TurboTax is a wonderful product. I don't want to disparage it in any way, shape or form, but it doesn't ask all the questions that really ought to be asked. Uh, it, it just doesn't. So you know I encourage everybody seek seek out seek out competent uh, uh, assistance when when you're dealing with your uh, with filing taxes. So resource wise, uh, the the things that I'm drawing from here today, uh, land grant University Tax Education Foundation or the acronym is LAGUDIF. Uh, I, I happen to be uh, involved with uh, some of the writing that goes into those products, but that's the group that puts out our uh, our textbooks for our for our tax courses that uh, that we do here at the University of Minnesota. And there's thirty there's thirty different land grant universities that belong to Lagutif, so you'll you'll see Lagutif material really all over the country. Now the ruraltax.org group uh, and we've I've, I've got the uh, you know we've got the the code there to scan or you can just go ruraltax.org uh, that that group I mean that website has a lot of uh, wealth of information that's out there uh, everything on there is free it's a public website and uh, you know I'd encourage you to go check that out a little bit uh, plus you know some of this material comes directly from IRS uh, it's posted on their website so that's largely where all the material is coming from here today now agenda wise what I'd like to do because I've because I've got you for a little over an hour with 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 questions and everything so the first thing I want to lead off with is the uh, you know, we, we've got an issue out there with uh, debt relief and cancellation of debt. A little bit of that's going to be a history lesson because we've we've had, um, you know, with with uh, with with passage of a variety of legislative pieces, you know, there's been some uh, you know there's been some debt relief that was involved with that. Uh, you know, uh, the, a lot of folks received that type of debt relief. Well, then last year we had a completely 180, uh, 180 degree turnaround of how the, uh, you know, how how Treasury and USDA was going to be handling those. So we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, plus the implications of those of those pieces. Now, uh, after that, I do want to touch just a tiny bit on record systems and character of income because when you're doing fall tax planning, 
it's really important that you understand what those different types of income are and how they get taxed. And then I want to talk some uh, tax planning strategies and examples uh, because we're nearing the end of the year and and uh, most farmers are cash basis filers. And, and that's something that we just want to make sure that we get buttoned up before the end of the year. All right, so let's kind of dive into the material here uh, on this. Now, the... Uh, you know the debt relief under the under the Inflation Reduction Act. That's what the IRA stands for. The uh, uh, now that this is going this is going back into some his, history uh, pieces here, folks. The uh, what what we have is this uh, you know this legislation actually Inflation Reduction Act was passed back in 2022, and it was uh, you know what it did is it created a situation where if somebody had an FSA loan uh, and it was, uh, you know, it, uh, if, if they had an FSA loan and they were in arrears, in other words, they were behind on payments, uh, they, this, triggered, uh, this triggered debt relief uh, from, the, uh, from the IRA. Now, when this originally came out, these were going to be ad hoc farm payments, all right? They uh, they were just basically they paid off the loan and then whatever the amount of money that was used to pay off that loan was reported to the farmer as uh, taxable income and it was reported on a 1099G which 1099G reports government uh, government payments. Now, long as the debt relief was over six hundred dollars, there was a there was a 1099G that was offered. Now, now if if this affected a producer, they also very likely received a 1098, which was showing the amount of interest that was paid on that loan because uh, you know that that also was involved in this uh, not debt forgiveness, but rather they were assistance payments. So. Uh, though that interest that was reported on the 1098 could be uh, taken as a deduction on Schedule F, and I always remind everybody at the tax at, at my tax schools on this, you know that uh, that 1099, or excuse me, the 1098, it differentiates between <clears throat> mortgage interest and other interest. Mortgage interest is secured by uh, real property as uh, as collateral and all other interest gets classified as interest. You want to make sure that you're matching those numbers or rather you don't want to overstate uh, the mortgage interest as to what's been reported on the 1098 on the return. And here's just a quick uh, look-see at what a 1099G is going to look like. The uh, the agricultural payments here, let me get, uh, get my pointer going here. No, not the pen, I want the, yeah. Uh, you know what what we have here is that's going to be uh, you know as I as I highlight this you know we're going to have agricultural payments that's going to be highlighted in the uh, in the uh, on the 1099 and that's going to have to be reported as income when you receive that on the tax return. So now this is history stuff still uh, when these payments were made when this debt relief happened. Uh, you know, oftentimes they were done by electronic transfer and the farmer received a letter indicating that this had happened. All right, in, in just about all cases, the farmer didn't get a check. Now, if they did in the rare cases where they did get a check, it was made out to both the farmer and the bank. And the farmer just had to endorse the check over to the bank and then that, that was used to, to pay off the loan. Now, in a lot of cases, nothing showed up in the farmer's bank account, you know, creating what I call a phantom transaction. So, you know, we had to rely on the letters that were sent and the 1099s that ended up showing up uh, at a future time. So bottom line is the payments that were received there, they were, they were ad hoc government payments. They were going to increase the taxable income and we're going to reduce an additional, we're going to, resulted in additional tax. So it was real critical when this started. We had a we had a big educational effort when this first was rolled out that uh, producers needed to be aware of the amount of money. They needed to get their records in order and they needed to do some mitigation efforts in order to 
to uh, mitigate the additional tax that was going to be due on account of these uh, these payments. So this is what this is what occurred. You know, essentially, this all happened prior to April of this year. All right, because there there were uh, there there was debt relief that occurred in 2022 and early 2023, and it's continued on all year long, uh, all all of all of uh, calendar year 2023. But early April, right before tax filing deadline, April 15th. All right, we Treasury and FSA had been in negotiations. And what they decided they were going to do is they were going to change the way that uh, these payments were taxed, all right? They recharacterized all that income. So what they did, the income that had been reported on a 1099-G, which forced everybody to put that down as taxable income on their tax return, was then changed to where it was reported as cancellation of debt income. All right. And uh, now some borrowers might be able to exclude some of that income because it was uh, because it was a cancellation of debt. But uh, now now if you had a guaranteed loan, now these these were the for, first of all, this was on direct loan borrowers that received this cancellation of debt. If if you had somebody that had a guaranteed loan at the bank through FSA, that was not uh, that was not uh, eligible for this cancellation of debt. So this is only affecting direct loans uh, from from Farm Service Agency. All right. Now, when they decided to do this, new forms were sent in April for the uh, debt relief that it, that had occurred prior to uh, to April of uh, 2023, and that might include 2023 transactions and 2022 transactions. Now, what they did is they sent a corrected 1099-G removing the government payment, and then they also issued a 1099-C showing that amount of payment on a cancellation of debt form. So let's let's look at what these are going to look like. You know, the 1099-G is going to show up, and there were two things that were going to show up on the corrected 1099-G. Uh, there's going to be there would be a uh, an X or a, the, there this there would be an X checked off in this corrected item. And anytime you get a corrected 1099, what that does is that supersedes all the 1099s that you received from that vendor previously for that particular tax year. And uh, and it also what it did is it would have been marked these these 1099 G's would have been marked as corrected and it would have a zero here. And they because the original 1099 that they would have received would have had the uh, the amount of the debt relief in the agricultural agricultural payments. All right. So what it did is it, it, it took away the government payment money that we had to report on the tax return. Now, the next thing that happened is uh, they issued a 1099-C and that is going to show the amount of debt discharged and it's also going to show the amount of interest that uh, that is on here. And uh, and and that was that, that's in in that that will the the amount of debt discharge is going to equal that 1099-G from the previous slide. All right, now let's look at the tax considerations here. All right, because because uh, you know so far we're not not trying to make anybody's you know anybody spin around. Tax tax stuff is complicated, folks. That's uh, that's one of the reasons I'm on here. The uh, you know, as far as Internal Revenue Code goes, um, what there may be some situations where you can exclude that cancellation of debt income from your gross income and not have to report it on your tax return. But it requires some, uh, you know, it requires some provisions that, that we need to talk about. Now, under these exclusions, there's two ways that you can exclude cancellation of debt income on a, on a return. Number one, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, taxpayer would have to be insolvent. 
meaning that they would have to owe more money than what they than what they own in in the form of assets and that's both business and personal so personal wise so uh you know a person would have to be insolvent uh debts exceed debt debt the debts the debt amount would exceed the amount of assets or uh it could possibly be that this that this uh uh forgiveness occurred with debt that was qualified farm indebtedness now now to to give you a layman's definition of that as long as this debt was used uh to service the farming operation all right if the debt was for for instance a tractor uh that's used in the farming operation if the loan was used for uh, if, if the loan was used for the purchase of livestock that was uh, produced in the farming operation, you know, the b bottom line is the debt needs to be uh, for, you know, the farm business, right? Now, now if, if we meet one of those two guidelines, all right, insolvency or qualified farm indebtedness, all right, both of those are going to require the taxpayer to reduce tax attributes in order to defer the tax liability. Now, let me explain what that means. All right, that means that uh, uh, we we just can't exclude it. What we have to do is there's a form that we have to fill out, and we have to reduce uh, if if the if the taxpayer happened to have a, a net operating loss, we'd have to reduce the net operating loss by the amount of cancellation of debt. Or if they happen to have business credits that we're carrying over, uh, we'd have we'd have to reduce the business credits. Or if they have basis in uh, assets, for instance, if you had uh, if you had uh, purchased breeding stock, or if you have some machinery uh, in the operation, uh, we we can reduce the basis of those assets. All right. If there's no net operating loss or no business credits or no or no uh, basis in assets to reduce then that cancellation of debt ends up going down as income and nothing really changed from what we uh, from what we had before all right uh, so we have to reduce the tax attributes in order to uh, you know in order to be able to utilize that cancellation of debt so uh, couple couple things to look at uh, if you have any follow-ups on this, uh, publication 225 that's the farmer's tax guide that that's a publication that's been around since the late 1940s and uh, it's a very helpful publication there's an entire section in there on cancellation of debt and i assure you i've reviewed that publication it's written it's written where the common person can talk about it uh, can can read it and understand it uh, there's also a publication 48, 4681, which is uh, about uh, cancellation of debt, repossessions, foreclosures, and abandonments, and uh, you know that also has a a nice section in it on the cancellation of debt. Uh, bottom line is, folks, if if you got one of these cancellation of debt forms, and your return had already been filed for 2022 you really have to sit down and have a conversation with your tax professional because what what you need to do is you need to you need to sit down uh talk with a tax professional determine whether or not you're able to take advantage of this cancellation of debt or not and uh, that that's really the first thing is to determine whether you can take advantage of it or not. If you can't take advantage of it and you already filed the return, say for instance, in 2022, and it's already filed and the cancellation of debt's not gonna change anything, you don't have to do a thing to these. All right, the only reason you need to go in and amend a return is if, is if you're gonna change something and it's gonna be advantageous for you to do so, all right. IRS is not going to require an amended return uh, just because of the 1099C. All right, IRS is aware of this issue. Okay, now, if you determine that you do qualify and you're able to take advantage of this cancellation of debt and you're able to exclude some of this, 
you will need to work with your tax professional to file an amended return. Change the numbers on the return because what, what, what you'll end up doing is you'll end up reducing that income from the 1099-G and you'll, and you'll have to add the income from the 1099-C and uh, there will have to be some, uh, some uh, tax attributes that, that uh, get reduced. That requires the, form, the filing of an additional form. But, uh, but, that, but those, are, uh, those uh, are going to be, uh, you know, those are, those are gonna be uh, an option there. Now, you know, would recommend, now this is, this is a little coming to, the, coming to the party late information, but uh, if you do decide to amend that return, bear in mind, there are some things, uh, particularly if you, uh, you say like on the 2022 return, if you took some, uh, you know, bonus depreciation on a on an asset to manage the tax bill, uh, those have to be amended. Those in order to revoke those elections, it has to be done within six months of the due date of the return. So, uh, you know, there there is a timeline on that, and we're kind of getting beyond that uh, beyond that deadline. So, uh, so you know, the the more the clock ticks. The more uh, you know, options. The, the 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 more options get taken off the table. Now, probably the best news of this whole thing is if you did receive debt relief, all right. And this is something. This this was part of the negotiated piece that went through the uh, uh, negotiation between Treasury and uh, FSA. Is that uh, producers are still going to be eligible? for USDA loans and programs, all right? Debt relief is not gonna make you ineligible for, uh, for that. Uh, you know, plus, if you apply the exclusion, uh, that's also not gonna affect future eligibility for FSA programs. So that, that's probably the best news that I have in this, in this whole piece. But uh, just to recap all of this, uh, if you happen to have received uh, what, you know, the, the corrected, uh, you know, cancellation of, well, the, the corrected 1099 G's and a cancellation of debt 1099, uh, you need to see your tax professional if you haven't already done so. All right. Size up what happens. Uh, if the tax professional isn't, isn't real sure what to do with that. I welcome those. I welcome those, uh, phone calls. I'll have my contact information up here at the end of the presentation. So, uh, Don, I'm, I'm looking at the chat and the q and I don't see any questions so far. I guess we, if we want to just kind of open this up right now, this, this kind of ends this little section right here. If anybody has questions on any of that, now would probably be a good time to address those. Yep, I don't see any questions. Um, okay. Let me just double check the other box here. Well, I don't, I don't, I, I don't see anything in the Q and A or the chat. So I, you know, but, but just put it out there. If anybody does have a question, they can, they can put it in. Yep. And seeing none, I will probably continue on here. All right. Um, moving on here. Uh, um, we're kind of shifting gears to a different uh, section. We kind of kind of have a section here on uh, that I refer to as a tax refresher. And uh, I, I always like to mention some things about records. Now, uh, I, I don't want to sound like I'm uh, chronologically challenged, but uh, I've been been around this business for a long, long time. And I can say emphatically that uh, you know, for, uh, for farmers, probably the least favorite chore that a farmer has to do is keeping records, uh, with without a doubt. I mean, they would rather be out working the cattle, doing something with the crops. You know, they'd rather be doing something outside. You know. Uh, Mess, messing around either on a computer or a record book or something that that is the least favorite of things that they want to do but folks it's probably the most necessary all right it it's it's really really critical that uh that that uh you, that you have a system 
it's really important that you have a system. Now, uh, I, I, before the current appointment that I have, I was, I was moved to my current position with the university when, uh, when uh, they, they wanted to move me into the role of being the tax school director. And so I switched jobs. Prior to that, I was, I was actually a field staff for one of our farm management associations. And I had, I had farmer clients. I worked with about a hundred farms and, uh, you know, I did, did summer visits, helped them with their records, filed tax returns. And, and, uh, you know, we did an analysis on them as well. So, uh, you know, the records were really, really critical on that, uh, in that regard, but, uh, the best suggestion that I can have, you know, and I, I tend to steer people towards computer software. There are some inexpensive options out there that are quite, that, that will work quite nicely for keeping records. Uh, you know, there's uh, programs out there like Quicken. You can buy, you can buy that off the shelf at Walmart or Costco or, or Sam's or, or just about any retail establishment that, uh, that sells uh, that sells software, but uh, you know, or certainly you can buy it online as well. But uh, you know, it does a nice job of just splitting stuff into categories, and uh, and and that works out quite well. You don't have to go out there and buy a farm specific program. Uh, that's just not that's just not not completely necessary. Uh, the biggest thing that I would that would really encourage you to do is if you when you start a record system uh reconcile 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 what that means is that when you type you type your records in out of your check register and what you do every month is you reconcile those transactions back to your bank statement that comes from the bank every month all right and that way you're assuring yourself that you've accounted for all money that went through your checking account now, if you've got some cash transactions on top of that, and and many folks do, you might be running a, you know, you might be running a truck farm, or you know, you might be growing vegetables and uh, selling at a farmer's market or something like that, uh, you know, where you have cash transactions. Now, we 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 have ways of accommodating that, but what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're accounting for everything that went through the bank account too, and once you start doing that, folks you'll never go back because you catch so many mistakes when you uh, when you do that it's really really critical now any record system really should should uh, account for you need to have a section for farm income a section for farm expense uh, you need to have a place kind of carved out for capital purchases because you know if you if you buy you know if you bought a piece of machinery or you bought a say you bought a bull uh, or you bought, or you bought a couple of cows, or you know you're buying breeding stock. Uh, that needs to be treated differently in the records, as opposed to uh, you know buying buying, for instance, uh, seed at the co-op uh, or wherever you buy seed at. Uh, plus, I kind of like the I kind of like all the personal expenses to be in there too, because if you're going to reconcile through the bank account through the checking account, you kind of have to have all the personal stuff in there. Otherwise, uh, you know, you've got this big uh, gap in there. Okay, so a tax refresher. Let's kind of run through this a little bit and uh, look at look at these items. Uh, the, the when you're looking at income tax basics. We, we're looking at farm income. All right, so ordinary farm income, it's going to be stuff that's going to go on your Schedule F. It's going to be uh, revenue generated from sale of commodities, livestock, maybe some custom services uh, provided as part of the operation. Uh, ordinary farm income is taxable to the producer. It's also subject to self-employment tax, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Now, Capital assets. Uh, first of all, let's kind of define uh, what capital assets are. Now, this is not the definition of capital assets you'll find in a college accounting textbook, but rather this is more of a layman's terms uh, definition. Now, in tax terms, capital assets are anything that the uh, that the taxpayer purchases that can't be deducted at the time of the purchase. Now, like 
the common things are machinery, breeding livestock, and you know buildings. If you happen to build like a barn or or a machine shed or something, uh, you know those costs are typically put up on the shelf, and you get to take those over a period. Uh, excuse me. Some capital assets are put up on the shelf, uh, like land. If you if you happen to buy a piece of ground, there's no deduction for land. It just you know it's basis that goes up on the shelf. It stays there until until you end up selling it. But in the case of something that's depreciable, like machinery or breeding livestock or say like a building. Uh, we're we're allowed to take a portion of that every year, and that's what depreciation is. So uh, you know, so so as far as the uh, capital assets go, essentially it's anything that we buy in the operation that we can't just let, write write the entire thing off at uh, at one time. All right, now sale of capital assets. Uh, usually if it's something that we had to depreciate like machinery or breeding livestock, it's going to get taxed as depreciation recapture. And the way that that gets taxed, it gets taxed as ordinary income, but it's not subject to self-employment tax. All right. On the wage and business income. Now there's uh, folks there, you know, with, with the passage of the tax cuts and jobs act back in 2017, we've got tax rates federally running anywhere from 10% to 37%, all right? And the, the more money you make, then you start getting pushed into those higher brackets. Now, just because you happen to get, you know, if you have a little bit of money into a higher bracket, doesn't mean you pay that higher bracket on everything. Because what, what we have is we've got lower brackets that we have that we fill up first. So, uh, you know, you're low, you know, the, 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 uh, the first money is taxed at a lower rate. It's only if you're into those other brackets, it's only the amount of money that's in that other bracket, in that higher bracket that gets taxed at the higher bracket. The, uh, the other thing worth mentioning is we've got self-employment tax. All right, now that's on business income. Farming operation is going to be business income. Uh, if, uh, you know, if somebody owned a hardware store in town, that's also going to be business income. So any earnings off a of trader business is going to be subject to self-employment tax. Now, uh, the easy way to figure that is that self-employment tax, it's also the same if you've got if you've got a job and you uh, do a W-2, you, you've probably noticed that there's FICA and Medicare withholdings. Well, FICA and Medicare withholdings is the equivalent of self-employment tax for an employed individual. If you're if you're a business owner, you pay self-employment tax on your tax return, and it's it's and it's essentially 15.3 percent of uh, of that qualifying income. Now it gets broken into two components. We don't need to get into that so much, but there's a there's there's two components of that: uh, old age survivor and disability insurance, and then there's a Medicare. Uh, portion the the OASDI portion of it does get capped, whereas the Medicare portion and there's no limit on it. All right, rental income. All right, in case somebody was uh, renting something out as part of your you know as part of your uh, you know your uh, operation, uh, you know rental income is considered passive, meaning that it's not considered a trader business. It's not subject to self-employment tax. All right. The, uh, you know, the, the only difference of that is, is if you happen to be uh, in the business of renting things out, that's where you could be paying self-employment tax on, uh, on rental income. Wage income, mentioned that earlier, that's going to be uh, coming off of a W-2. Uh, there's going to be FICA and Medicare withholding that gets taken on that, and uh, but otherwise, wage income is just taxed at whatever bracket that you're in. You know, and there's no there's no self-employment tax based on that. Already talked about depreciation to a certain extent because uh, you know with qualifying capital assets, the uh, you know machinery, breeding livestock, buildings, drainage tile. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to get a you, we get a portion of those expenses every year, all right. Uh, certain assets we spread those assets over a certain certain period of life. For instance, uh, new machinery 
gets uh, depreciated over five years. So we spread that we spread that expense over a five year period of time. Uh, used machinery gets spread over a seven year period of time. Uh, if you if you bought if you bought a bull, we have to spread that cost of that bull over a five year period of time. So e every different type of asset has a, has a specific number of years that we have to spread those uh, spread those expenses out over. Now we mentioned depreciation recapture earlier. If you sell machinery, that's the way this is going to get taxed. All right, ordinary income, but it's not subject to self-employment tax. It gets reported on the 4797. So let's just look at this example. Let's say that we had a, you know, we say we had a utility tractor, and uh, we end up selling this utility tractor for twenty thousand dollars. All right. Now, my assumption in this matter is, is that we purchased this tractor several years ago and we've already either depreciated it out or we've or we've expensed it uh, using accelerated depreciation. So when we sell this thing, all the twenty thousand dollars that we uh, that we collect on this is going to be depreciation recapture unless we sold it for more money than we bought it for. And machinery transactions just don't work that way. So one other thing that we want to talk about here quickly is the like kind exchanges. Now, like kind exchange is uh, is where you can swap property. Uh, you, you, you can you can swap out property and not recognize any gain from that transaction. Now, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which was the major tax reform back in 2017, change this rule we used to be able to trade machinery uh say for instance if i you know if if i were a farmer and i wanted to you know i i had an old let's say i had an older tractor and i wanted to trade the older tractor in on a newer model all right i go to the i go to the implement dealership and i trade in my old tractor they're going to allow me a, they're going to give me an allowance on the trade of the old tractor that I that I have in here. What we used to be able to do is is uh, I would only pay the net difference on that, and I didn't have to recognize the the trade in of the old tractor. Now that that uh, has changed. All right, this is the old method pre 2017. All right, if if I were trading if I were trading equipment. Okay, what, what I did is I take the old tractor in and the, the dealership's going to allow me $20,000 on, uh, on, on my trade-in. If I were to buy the new tractor outright, it would be $45,000. They're allowing me twenty, dollars So all I'm, all I'm really doing here is I'm paying $25,000. Uh, I'm paying, I'm paying the dealership $25,000 giving them the old tractor and I'm walking out the door with a $45,000 tractor, All right? I didn't have to recognize any income under the old method. Now, since 2017, this all changed. All right, same scenario here. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, get the, I'm, I'm buying a $45,000 tractor. The dealership is allowing me 20,000 on the trade. But what I've got to do now is I have to recognize the twenty thousand dollars of uh, allowance. That's considered now a sale. So I've got I've got to show that on my tax return as a machinery sale, and then I turn around and I outright completely purchase the forty five thousand dollar tractor. That's going to be what I'm going to depreciate moving forward. Okay, capital gains. The only two things that you're really going to get capital gains, and you know, for 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 the for for a typical farming operation, the only thing that you're going to really see capital gains on is if you happen to sell a piece of property, uh, sell some sell some bare land, uh, or you happen to sell some raised breeding stock that you've held on to for the appropriate holding period. For example, if you had if you had a raised uh, you know, say say you had a uh, a cow, a raised cow that you uh, that was born on the farm, uh, and you sold this thing. Long as long as you've had that cow for two years, it gets long term capital gain treatment. All right, and that when that gets sold, uh, you get capital gain treatment, which is more favorable than selling it as a Schedule F item. All right. Uh, 
capital gains rates. Uh, I pulled this right from the IRS website, uh, but but uh, you know for for your filing statuses that you have here, uh, you know there there is a possibility that you can uh, actually have a zero percent capital gains rate on this. So you know capital gains are very favorable. But going back to what I was talking about earlier on the records, it's real important to make sure that you separate out the, you know, if you're selling something, you want to make sure that if you're selling something like a, like a raised cow uh, versus calves, you need to make sure that those are reflected in your records because you don't want to over-report income. Uh, and that's, that's why the records are so, so important. Now, this graph kind of represents what uh, what's going on with depreciation recapture. Uh, if we purchased a, uh, if we purchased a, so let's say for instance, I purchased a piece of equipment for $10,000 and I hang, on, I hang on to it for a while and I depreciated it over the course of time that I held this thing, I depreciated it $5,000. Okay, so we had $10,000 to begin with, I depreciated five. So I've got $5,000 adjusted basis in this thing. Now, this is something that will never ever happen, but it, it, it illustrates the point. Let's say that I took that piece of machinery and I sold it for $20,000. Now that's never gonna happen with a piece of used machinery, all right, that you're gonna sell it for more money than what you paid for it to begin with. But uh, we, we start with the 5,000 and we got a $20,000 sale. I get to deduct the adjusted basis down here. So I pay nothing on that. But the next 5,000 is going to be depreciation recapture through here. This $5,000 here is going to be depreciation recapture, ordinary income, not subject to self-employment tax. Now, because we sold this thing for more than what we purchased it for, this here is going to get capital gain treatment. All right. And it's going to be whatever the capital gain rate is, depending on the amount of income that we have on the return. All right. That, pre that prior uh, tax chart showed showed where the rate breaks are all right so so that's what depreciation recapture is okay qualified business income just to, uh, there's several slides on this but i'm only going to talk about it for maybe a couple minutes uh is all but uh you know and first of all qbi or qualified business income uh this is something that came out of the tax cuts and jobs act it expires at the end of 2025, all right. It's one of it's one of those provisions that is going to expire. With uh, there's a lot of provisions of Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that expires at the end of 2025. Uh, this happens to be one of them. But there's two ways that you can get this 20% uh, deduction. Uh, it's either 20% of your of your uh, qualifying business income and farm income is going to be is going to be qualified business income. It's also going to include, uh, you know, if you have depreciation recapture from the sale of a piece of uh, equipment, that also is considered qualifying business income. So, so we get a 20% deduction on that. Now, uh, for some of some folks, if you're doing business with a cooperative, if you're buying farm supplies or you're marketing your commodity through a through a farmer's cooperative, uh, the farmer's cooperative also can uh, issue uh, a QBI deduction, qualified business income deduction based on the sales that you did with the co-op. All right, so there's actually two ways that you can do that. Can be from your own schedule F, or it can be resulting from those sales to a cooperative. Now, the uh, the thing is, if you're selling to a cooperative because you're qualifying for two deductions, if you're selling to a cooperative, there is a mandatory reduction that we have to do. This is an adjustment that your tax professional does. Just understand that there's a reduction that that uh, has to occur if you're selling to a co-op but it but it's but it's keyed it's keying off of if you're paying wages or not if you don't have an employee and you're not paying any wages out then there's going to be no reduction on your part which is which is advantageous for the producer all right let's look here at our uh, uh this is a new tax rate table that uh, that we had and and uh, don 
I, I owe you folks an apology. This the 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 part the the uh, handout that I sent you had the 2022 graph on this particular page, All right? This graph is in this graph is in the power the slide deck two more times, and the the other two times that it's there is the 2023 graph. I just missed I missed copying this one before I sent that off to you, and I apologize. But uh, this is a chart that I've used for years. Uh, and uh, what what I do is uh, at at year end when uh, when we're doing fall tax planning when I'm sitting down with a producer uh, this is the chart that that pretty much helps that producer understand what happens with tax rates and what happens with with fall tax planning. Now, folks, here here's income in thousands all the way all the way across here and then we've got our tax rates here now this only takes into account federal rates if you're subject to state income tax has nothing to do with this all right this this does not take into account state rates this is only federal rates but but this helps illustrate uh the blue line here are your income tax rates. All right, we've got a 10% rate, a 12% rate, and then we jump up here to a 22% rate. Uh, and, and it and it goes, you know, the, the rates continue on out to the right, but uh, but this this still illustrates what's going on. Now, self-employment tax, 15.3%. It it runs out here to you meant you you remember I mentioned that there was a limit to one of the components of the self employment tax the OASDIA old age survivor disability insurance okay that stops out here at about one hundred and sixty thousand and then it drops down but there's a two point nine percent Medicare portion that goes out into infinity uh, so. The green line is just combining everything. All right, this is the you know you add this plus this gets you the green line. So so on on our income tax rates, if I've got income out here at about fifty thousand, you know we're paying about twenty six twenty seven percent on you know for for federal rate between the uh, between the self employment tax and the and the regular tax. So uh, uh, so so that that's this is how the rates work. Uh, there are some adjustments, and this isn't this isn't perfect all the time, but at least it illustrates where we're at from a rate standpoint. Okay, let's talk uh, strategies here a little bit as I'm looking at the clock here, and I need to need to keep trucking here. Excuse me. The um, now here's some tax planning strategies for the end of the year. Uh, first of all, we can prepay expenses. We'll talk about that a little more. Income averaging, deferral of income, uh, accelerated depreciation, and we'll also talk about crop insurance deferral. So first of all, on, on prepaid expenses. Now, most farmers are cash basis filers. So you're allowed to prepay up to 50% of your Schedule F expenses. Now, you're on on uh, prepaying expenses. You are limited to stuff that's going to be applied to the 12 month rule. So if you're if you're prepaying something that is going to get you benefit beyond a 12 month period of time, you're not allowed to do that. All right, like an example here, if uh, you know we we got a uh, you know a farmer paid an insurance premium. It was a it was a 12 month insurance premium that they paid in November, uh, and it does not extend beyond the 12 months. So we're we're certainly allowed to uh, to prepay that. Now, one rule that we definitely is a hard fast rule. It's been around for for probably 30 plus years. Is uh, you can't prepay interest if you have a loan at the bank. You can uh, you can pay all of the accrued interest to date to the end of the year but you can't prepay interest at the bank that that uh, you know that's not allowed uh, as far as the uh, limit goes you know we're limited to uh you know when you when you look at the total schedule f at the end of the year uh you're allowed to prepay half of the uh half of the expenses on that schedule f counting depreciation so uh you know the as far as uh what that what that's going to entitle you to do 
uh, a lot of producers will go and they will buy their seed for the next year. They'll buy their fertilizer, you know, in some, some realms, it's okay to use fertilizer depending on your individual practices. You know, fertilizer might be on that list. Supplies, uh, also, uh, you know, potentially, uh, potentially chemicals. And, and again, depending on what your, what your farming operation, that might be applicable and it might not be applicable, but uh, what it's in, what it's allowing you to do is it's allowing you to buy the supplies and crop inputs or livestock inputs that you're going to be using for the coming year. You can pay for those things at the end of the year before. All right. And, and, and we're entitled to do that. So uh, the three part test for prepaid expense. And I've run into folks that, uh, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, when I'm doing year year end tax planning or I'm filing a return, this is something that I always try to look at. All right, it needs to be a payment and not a deposit. What I want to do is I want to see the paper from the co-op. If they if they prepaid at the co-op, I want to see the paper saying that, all right, I bought this much fertilizer, I bought this, you know, bought fertilizer, chemicals, seed. Uh, bailing twine, you know, whatever, whatever it is that we bought, and I want to see an itemized list. All right, if if they hand me a piece of paper and it says money on account, uh, this was not a purchase, then then it's not entitled. So you need to make sure that you're actually buying something. All right, valid business purpose. It, it's simple because what we're doing is if we're buying it ahead of time, what we're doing is we're assuring ourselves of supply and we're fixing our price. All right. So, uh, you know, that's the valid reason. And the, the, the code and farmer's tax guide says that we're not supposed to materially distort the income. I, we, we can bat around with those, with those words and everything there, but, uh, you know, as long as we're not doing anything, just, just egregious on this. Uh, but of course the reason we're doing this is to manage the tax bill. So I've, I've oftentimes had problems with, Number three there, uh, income averaging. Just note that this is something that's an option because this is something that could save you a bunch of money on the taxes. You need to talk to your tax professional on this. Now, uh, for income averaging, it only works for farm income, all right? It doesn't affect self-employment tax. It also doesn't affect taxable income. What it does is it affects the tax rates for the income that you have. Now, graphically here, uh, this is the same graph as I had last year. I just updated the years on this thing. Now, here's a situation where income averaging would do you a lot of good. All right, let's say for instance that, uh, that these are the income levels for 20, 21, 22, and 23. All right, we had, we had uh, you know, on this, what this is, this line represents the top of the 12% bracket. So this is 12% money down here. This is 22% money up here. All right, we've got we've got gaps. We were below the top of the 12% bracket for these three years, but we had a really, really good year in 2023. All right, so uh, what we can do with income averaging is we have to, we, we can take money from here and we can put it into these prior three years. But now, now the caveat is, is that, it has to, we have to, we have to put the same amount of money into all three of the back years. So what we do is we figure out, all right, what's kind of the sweet spot for where it's going to give us the biggest bang for our buck, but we're going to take, we're going to take money from here and we're going to put it back here and we're going to get 12% treatment on the amount of money that we put back here into these open slots. All right, we can take advantage of these unused 12% portions in those prior three years. And that's essentially what's happening with income averaging. Like I said earlier, it doesn't affect self-employment tax. It's it's not gonna affect taxable income because the taxable income is just there. What we're doing is we're manipulating the rates that we're able to, uh, to pay on those. Okay, livestock. Now I know I've probably got some livestock producers on here. And, uh, and so, so I wanted to make sure that I hit this. Uh, especially now, now, uh, you know, depending on where everybody's located here, uh, you know, we've, we've got, you know, speaking in terms of Minnesota, we have, uh, quite a few counties that are federal disaster areas in, uh, in Minnesota this year, 
due to drought. I'm guessing South Dakota is going to be a similar type of situation. But uh, you know what? What uh, crop and livestock sales? We have some options where we can defer income uh, for for those sales. And what we want to talk about here is, uh, you know, this this first of all is uh, deferred sales contracts. Now, what this is is this is a technique that's used if you've got commodity and you uh, you uh, say you go to the elevator or the grain merchandiser, it, and this works better with grain than it does livestock. But what you do is you you engage in you and you and you enter into a deferred sales contract where you're actually getting rid of the livestock now and and typically let's say that you typically market livestock right now in october or november and uh, what you do is you sign a deferred payment contract which means that you're not going to get paid until after the first of the year all right and uh you know so that pushes that income out but you got to have a signed contract and you can't take that money if you take the money early you got to treat it as income in 2023 all right the the main thing that I want to make sure everybody knows is this bullet right here. All right, if you engage in these deferred sales contracts, you are an unsecured creditor. So it's 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 a little riskier than your normal transactions. If something happens to that grain elevator or the person that's buying it and they have financial trouble and you don't end up getting paid, you're an unsecured creditor. So if it goes to bankruptcy court, you're pretty much the last person that's going to get paid on that thing. So so I normally like to take care of prepayments and everything else. I tend to do this last. All right, weather related provisions. Uh, two two quick things that I want to touch on on this and and uh, trot trot through this uh, quickly on uh, you know this this is, has to do with uh, sales of animals that are due to weather related conditions. Now, because we had so much drought here, we're seeing a lot of this in Minnesota this year. And uh, you know, what we're doing is we're able to do some, we're, we're able to postpone some sales of livestock, whether if, it, if it's weather related. Now there's two different categories of weather related sales of livestock. All right, you've got your breeding stock. So this would be your cows, your bulls, probably primarily the cows. Uh, so if if you were in a drought area and you had to sell some of the cows off because you just didn't have feed for them, all right, which is a common a common thing, all right. If it was due to weather conditions and you had to sell some of your cows off, you can postpone the gain on those animals uh, for up to two years. The provision is is you got to buy them back within a two year period of time. And uh, you, so you don't have to recognize the gain of those animals, even though they were sold in 2023. All right, you don't have to have a disaster declaration in order to do that. I mean, it's an election you have to file with the with the tax return. Now, the uh, the next thing is is those are your animals raised for sale. This is in the cow calf situation. This would be the calves. All right. If, uh, if you know if you uh, you know if you you typically producers establish you know each year they're gonna they're gonna you know they they may sell a certain number of calves and they may retain a certain number of them to grow them to yearling weight and then they'll and then they'll sell them they'll sell them off after that period of time they'll sell them off as yearlings but uh, in this case. These are raised for an, these are raised animals that were born on the farm, and we raise those animals. Now, uh, if we had to sell some of the, if we had to sell more calves than what we normally would sell, due to weather-related circumstances, we can postpone those sales and put those into the next year because that's normally when we would have sold them. All right. Now, uh, this is an election. It's a little more complicated. To, to do this for raised livestock, you do have to have a federal disaster declaration in the county that you're in, or it's got to be an adjacent county, meaning that a county touching your county is, is uh, you know, was a disaster area. If you got those circumstances, then it's okay to do this. Now, all, all we don't have to do a buyback or anything like that. All we're doing is we're just postponing that income is all we're doing. 
All right, so those are the two things for weather-related sales. Now, let's talk depreciation here real quick. Uh, 170, section 179, this is if you bought a capital asset that was a qualifying asset, all right? Purchased breeding stock is gonna fit this. Machinery is gonna buy this. Or machinery is gonna also fit this. Uh, if you uh, purchased these capital assets during the year and you're looking for a quick, quick expense, you can write off the entire purchase cost in the year of purchase, all right? And it's done under this section 179 election. Now, we, we have ridiculously high uh, maximums on this. I mean, over $1.16 million. So, uh, you know, for, for, uh, for small, medium-sized producers, this is more than enough to, uh, to get everything done. There, there is a qualifying purchase limit. Again, we've got a ridiculously large number, but this is a very versatile, uh, probably one of the most powerful tax management tools that we have in the toolbox. Uh, equipment, uh, this is something your tax professional is gonna know. New equipment is five-year property, used equipment is seven-year property, and uh, the uh, you know your grain bins, cotton ginning, fences, they're all seven-year property. Uh, those, those are the major things that we want to talk about there. Now, bonus. All right, bonus is another way of writing off capital assets fast. Now, bonus is uh, available for essentially the same assets that 179 is for, in, plus it adds farm buildings. All right, farm, you can do, you can do bonus on farm buildings building so if you bought a if you if you build a barn or a lean to or a machine shed in 2023 you can take bonus on that where you can't take 179 all right it's not eligible now in 2023 the the allow the allowance for the deduction is 80 percent all right so it's not it's no longer 100 percent we're at 80 percent but that's still you're able to write off 80 percent of those assets now bonus it the the tax return the way it's designed is it's designed to to take it automatically and you have to tell the tax software or you have to tell the tax return not to take it you have to elect out of it if you don't want to take it uh, and there there are related party rules you can't you know if you bought something from your dad uh, you can't uh, take 179 or bonus on something if it's a related party transaction. Okay, real quickly on deferral of uh, crop insurance, uh, it, it, because uh, with the drought and everything here, folks, there there very likely will be some uh, def some crop insurance uh, that's paid out this year. The couple couple things that uh, to to bear in mind, you got to be a cash basis filer, which is ninety nine point nine percent of the producers out there. The other thing we want to point out here is that you cannot defer revenue portion. Uh, about uh, 20 years ago, the uh, we started to see some uh, crop insurance policies out there that not only insured for damage and destruction, but it insures for revenue protection. All right, revenue protection is not deferrable. If you if 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 your policy triggers a revenue payment, you got to take that in the year that, uh, that that it happens. But if you got damage and destruction, and you normally would def you normally would sell that crop the following year, then you're allowed to defer that. Now, uh, got to be cash basis in order to do that, and you need to establish that you normally would have reported that in the following year. Now, we do have some funky rules on this because uh, you know if you if you're a single cropper. You, you only grow one crop. It's this is pretty easy to to meet. Uh, you, you need to look at each crop, each commodity that you're growing, and you need to look at these separately. You need to you need to look at each crop, and you have to be showing that you normally would sell over half that crop the following year. So, if if I were to do an example where I'm sitting right now, uh, if I've got a producer that's growing corn, soybeans wheat all right in uh, in southwest minnesota so uh what i'm going to do is i'm going to sit down with them and i'm going to look at this all right are you normally selling over half the corn every year in the next year answer yes they're normally doing the same thing with the beans they normally sell over half the crop 
then then we're okay with that. If they're doing the same thing with the with the wheat, then we can we can then defer into the following year. All right, if we're not meeting the test with one of those commodities, it throws the whole thing out. It poisons the well and we're not able to do any of it. This is an all or none uh, option. So it it uh, I don't I don't like the way that this these rules are written because I think there ought to be more flexibility, but that's as much editorial as I'm going to give on that. Okay, uh, tax planning. Let's uh, look at this. This is our kind of our final section here. Uh, just kind of looking at uh, looking at some examples here of uh, and I, and I think this this gives you some practical pointers on some things to look at for your fall tax planning. Uh, what I've got here is I've, I've, I've laid out a couple of scenarios and I actually ran some numbers through tax software when I put this together. Uh, we've got a, a couple filed married filing joint, no kids. Uh, there's $30,000 worth of wage income on the return. They've got a little bit of interest in dividends. The Schedule F has a $50,000 net, but what they did is they traded a piece of machinery. All right, so they got a hundred thousand dollar trade allowance on there, so that's adding a hundred thousand dollars worth of income to this particular return. All right, so here's our tax rates. These are coming right from uh, these are coming right from uh, IRS uh, as far as the the different rates that we have going on here. Now, uh, what we want to pay attention to in particular is uh, this is a these are the joint returns. That top of that 12% bracket is 89,450. All right, so that's kind of a critical thing to look at on this. Uh, also, we've got a standard deduction. All right, we no longer have exemptions, but we have a standard deduction for married filing joint that's going to take off $27,700. So that's a deduction that we get right off the top when we file. Now, what I've done is I created a kind of a summary thing in a spreadsheet here, and I think this does an okay job of uh of uh, of summarizing everything that we that we have here because i've got uh folks if you follow along with me we've got our wage income here all right we've got uh that uh that uh interest interest in dividends and i think i blew it i think i had 1200 this is 500 so that's my mistake i'm sorry uh we got fifty thousand dollars on the farm uh we've got uh twenty five thousand did I do? Let's, uh, I think that that's the wrong. Now let's, uh, let's skip that one. That's that, I think that's, that's an old, that's something that uh, is in the wrong spot. Okay. Um, again, we've got this chart that we're looking at here in this uh, tax planning example, we'll, we'll come back here. Let's summarize this thing. Okay, so in this example that we that we just laid out, we've got taxable income of $59,000. And with, without doing any kind of adjustments to this, the, the given information that I had here, we had federal tax due of about 6,600. We had a little over $7,000 worth of self-employment tax. Add that up, it's about a $13,000 tax bill. All right, our marginal rate's 12 and the effective tax rate's about 23%, meaning that we're in the 12% bracket, but with self-employment and everything, it's about 23%. All right, so the difference is what we're gonna do with this is uh, what we're gonna do is we're, we're uh, going to take some accelerated depreciation. We're gonna do some fast write-off of the new equipment. We're gonna take a $10,000 deduction Plus, we're going to prepay some farm expense. All right, so we're we're going to add twenty five thousand dollars worth of expense to this particular uh, to this particular piece here. And then, so so what I've got here is is we're adding you know we're adding a, we're adding another twenty five thousand to this uh, to this example here. And uh, what that's doing is that's decreasing my uh, that's decreasing my taxable income. So essentially what I've done is I've lowered my taxable income from to 40,000. My federal tax is 44, my self-employment tax is 3,500, total tax is 79.92, and I've lowered my marginal and my effective rates. Now, what, what uh, here's the analysis that we wanna look at here. We spent an additional $25,000 
in prepayments and an accelerated depreciation. We cut the tax bill by just about $6,000. So what we did is for, for every dollar that we spent in the way of prepayments and accelerated depreciation, we're saving about 23 cents of tax on the dollar for everything that we that we spent on that. So uh, you know, essentially what we did, uh, let me let me back up here quickly. Okay, our, our taxable income in our previous example, we went from 59,414. And we after our prepayments, we ended up at uh, 4826. So let's look at the chart here and talk a little bit about this. So what, what we did in this example is we went from about right here, 59,000. And in doing the prepayments and everything, we went down to about here on the 40,000. Now the, now the thing worth noting in this example is that we did not change any tax rates. We didn't go to a different bracket in this particular situation. All right, now, if you were to say to go from here down to here, you know, then, then we're reducing some tax rates or better yet, you know, uh, if, if, you've got, if you've got somebody that uh, when you're starting to do the tax planning, if they're up here in the middle of the hump, which is, which is taking a lot of income, I realize that, but if they prepay from here down to here, there, you know, there, there's a real big, there's a real big tax savings when you start doing the prepayments and you and you get out of this really high bracket up here. All right, so um, bottom line is, folks, I guess that kind of wraps up what I've got. Uh, assume I, I plan for some time for some questions, but uh, are there any questions out there, any type? Because I'll. I'll hang out here for a while and we'll certainly uh, address those. I don't see any questions in the chat, Rob, but I did give folks the option to unmute. So if anyone has a question that they would rather not type in the chat, you're welcome to unmute and um, just ask your question out loud. Um, yes. Can you folks hear me? Hey, yes. Shannon. Yep. Hi. Um, see, I just have a question. Maybe I missed it, but is this going to be, is this recorded? Yep, Fanny, this will go on our website and I'll send it out to all the participants as well. Okay. I really appreciate that. Thank you. A lot of great, great information. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I think it went really well, Rob. Any question that I had and I had jotted down, you answered it immediately after I jotted it down. So all my questions are answered throughout the entire presentation. Okay, well, very, very good. I appreciate that. Did you, did you send out a... Uh... You send out it did you send out a copy of the PowerPoint to everybody that registered? Nope, that'll go out after, but if you want to update it with that new slide, let, let me update it. There's there's two of those slides that are in error, and I I uh, uh or I or I want to double check it. I think there there's there one there one slide or the other is wrong on here, and I thought I I I missed that when we uh, when I put that together. But uh, okay. I think I think it's possibly one slide that's wrong. Okay, no problem. That's perfectly fine. All right, Justine said same here, uh, Rob. That was awesome. Well, thank you, thank you. Okay. Well, if there's no questions, folks, um, I think Rob, you could move your slide to your contact information if anyone has any questions. And do. Yeah, here's my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me if you if you have questions. Now, uh, one one caveat that I will that I will uh, 
uh, announce. I I am in my season for uh, I'm doing a lot of tax schools right now. So I, and I plus I do a lot of traveling and everything. So I, I would encourage everybody. Uh, email this time of the year is probably the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, I, I, I don't, I, under no circumstances do I want to discourage anybody calling because I'll be happy to talk with you. It's just that, uh, there's, there's probably a better than even chance. I'm, I'm not going to be here on a given day because I'm, uh, I'm out doing a lot of programs. Perfect. Well, thanks Rob. We always appreciate this. This is some very helpful information for all of our producers here. Um, this is recorded. It will go up on our website. Um, we also have other recordings on our website too, um, such as ways to diversify your ag income, how to start and maintain your business credit as well as your personal credit. And then we have others from different partners like the Indian Nations Conservation Alliance. So please take a moment to check those out on our website. Um, sign up for our newsletter if you'd like to see any upcoming webinars that we may have. Um, but thank you again, Rob, and thanks everyone for attending today. We appreciate you. Um, you're welcome to reach out to us with any questions that you may have um, via email. Rob, is there anything else you'd like to mention? Uh, no, I think that, think that pretty much covers it. So uh, just if anybody has any questions, feel free to follow up with me and, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll uh, address those as they come in. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. All right. Thank you.